So I'm going to ask a question which many of you will give a differing opinion. Just who invented the railway? There's a very strong argument for the Victorians and yeah, the modern railway as we know today would not be what it is without them. But if they invented it, then how do we explain tracks found in the 16th century mines? Maybe these were the original inventors. There's not really many references before that. That was until builders working on the construction of a canal in Greece found something rather unexpected and it could put the birthplace of the railway a lot earlier than many had actually perceived. Ancient Greece, yes that far, is cited for having great innovation which helped shape our modern world. Plato was alive and well and was teaching his works to Aristotle having learned from Socrates. The Peloponnesus Peninsula is at the very southern tip of the mainland. As this peninsula was attached by only one land bridge, boats would have to sail around the peninsula to get from the Ionian Sea to the Aegean Sea. This was a big problem as the seas were rough and many boats foundered on the rocks around it. So rather than go around this land and having days on to a journey, a guided roadway that boats could use called the Diakos was formed. It is not known just who constructed the Diakos or exactly when, but records go back as 600 BC. Even then it appeared well established and ingrained in daily life. But how did it all work? Ships heading towards Cyprus would first stop at the port of Corinth. These would be merchant ships, usually single sailed, with a strong wooden frame, similar to the reconstructed ship, the Phoenician. The ships would be made from Mediterranean oak and olive wood tenons and weighed in around about 50 tons. It had a single mast standing around 15 metres high and the boat was held together with iron nails. To help with steering, instead of a rudder, the steersmen used a pair of steering oars and separate oars were used for rowing in case of lack of wind or if the boat were coming into port. The ship would be laden with items for trade. From metals to papyrus, the sailors would trade anything. Once reaching the port, the ship's rigging was stripped, as was the sails and the mast. Anything that could be was removed, and the process usually started at sea, as the ship was being brought into port using oar power. The hull was then hauled ashore by the use of pulleys and winches onto a special wooden plinth and the ship was stabilised with oak beams designed to hold the keel upright. The plinth only had one purpose, to help turn the vessel towards the diacloss. The hull would then be hauled up a ramp where the diacloss lay below. On this roadway would be a large wheeled truck, kind of like a flatbed. The top of the flatbed would sit level with the top of the ramp, and with the help of more pulleys, ropes and winches, the hull was manoeuvred off the plinth and onto this truck. To help guide the truck, twin grooves would guide the wheels and the whole thing would be pulled either by animals or slaves. The mast, the cargo and any items removed from the hull would be pulled separately by animals and followed behind. The diacloss varied in width but the grooves fitted perfectly with the wheels of the truck and to help, the centre of the diacloss was raised. Coarse limestone would be used in its construction and proved to be a strong, sturdy material to take the weight of the hull. Some stones were purpose cut for the job, especially those that were used to guide the wheels. But many stones were recycled from fallen temples and old structures. We know this because the ancient text that is on these stones is still visible today. But why build this rudimentary railway in the first place? Canals to take boats across have been attempted to be built, however the project kept failing. It was just too big of an ass to cut that far into pretty much bedrock. It was said that Perinda had quoted that the merging of the two oceans would cause the downfall of the Corinth and he knew the solution was needed so the Diacos was formed. After several days of being hauled by hand, the boat would arrive at the western port. 
The process of getting the boat from the deer cross to the water is basically the same, but in reverse. Once the rigging was reattached and the mast restored, the ship set sail once again. From texts and historical records, we know that the deer cross was not used to haul just freight. It was also a major game changer in warfare. It was written that the Spartans, racing to Athens, used the deer cross to speed up the journey. And in 102 BC, the warrior Marcus Antonius was sent with his army to attack pirates. It was even documented during Anthony and Cleopatra's time. The deer cross was in regular service for at least the next 1500 years and was still in use up to the 9th century. However, it was getting used less and less. By 1150 AD, most ships were using alternative routes and were built much stronger to handle the rough seas. The deer cross over time was eventually abandoned to the elements, with much of it ended up buried or eroded into the sea. In 1893, Perinda's original concept canal was rejuvenated and was able to be built, but as the deer cross ran over the narrowest parts of the land bridge, much of it was lost in its construction before anyone realised what they had. Luckily, archaeologist Abagarod Lolling identified the remains of the deer cross and realised just what a monument he had on his hands. Although much was lost, including the eastern port, he and fellow archaeologists were able to excavate a kilometre and find its western port. There are also proposals to restore parts of the roadway and reconnect the disjointed pieces back into one structure. The eastern port too will be getting some attention as it's hoped it can be restored so it's not lost to the sea. Today, although parts of the deer cross remain, it is not advisable to seek out these areas just yet. The Greek authorities are working with the government to create a safe, protected route that will not only enable tourists to visit the site safely, but to also help preserve the deer cross for future generations. Much of the structure resides either on private land or is dangerously close to the canal. In addition, tourists can damage the stones many times accidentally or cause themselves injury as many of the stones are loose and can roll underfoot. So is the Deer Cross the first ever railway? I'd say technically yeah, especially if you count the Hator tramways and the other stone tramways. But I'll let you ponder on that and once it's fully opened and ready for the public eye, it may become an interesting feature for many enthusiasts to see as potentially an original railway built before the birth of Christ.